Yeah. Um, Martha Cole, this is fun because it's a really cool bio. Martha Cole is a historian of the Montana Historical Society. She received both her BA and MA in history from Washington University in St. Louis. She heads up the Montana Historical Society's outreach to educators and served as project manager and lead historian for Montana Stories of the Land, the Society's middle school Montana history textbook and the web-based projects, Montana's Women History Matters and Montana and the Great War all three of which received awards of merit from AASLH. She has written articles for many history journals, including Montana, the Magazine of Western History, is the editor of Beyond School Marms and Madams, Montana's Women's, Montana Women's Lives, published in 2015, and is a contributing editor to The History of Montana and 100, uh, 101 Objects, published in 2021. She is also the author of I Do, A Cultural History of Montana Weddings. I just lost the thing, let me see. Weddings, which was published in 2011. So this should be really cool. Um, so I'm introducing Martha Cole. Well, and I am completely delighted to be here with you. I'm gonna put a link in the chat to a Google Doc that has the links for everything I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about different documents and different things. And if people want to look into it further, that um, that has the the link in it. Um, so I was asked to sort of give a overview of sort of social studies education in Montana and what's going on. Um, uh, and so there's several different things. Um, uh, we have new um, state standards that just uh, were just um, adopted. Um, I bet that people have been listening a little bit to the critical race theory debate, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, and also um, always um, the essential understandings regarding Montana Indians. So I'm just gonna talk about all of those things. Um, and hopefully there we go, starting with the new state standards. So they were adopted in 2020 and they're effective as uh, July 1st, 2021. Um, and the league actually had a member, Sherry Meter, at the table during the final review process. And I listened to the um, negotiated rulemaking committee um, meetings um, recordings and Sherry did a great job uh, pushing for um, civics education and uh, to have civics mean more than, um, to mean participation and uh, engagement, civic engagement, as opposed to following rules. So I, I was really impressed with um, Sherry. So school districts um, have five years to implement these state standards. What you need to know is that, um, uh, so they, they, they're in effect, but schools, rotate every year, you know, one year billing school district might be looking at the math standards and updating them. And then the next year they'll look at the, the English language arts standards. And then the next year they'll look at the social studies standards. So because school districts have this revolving um, review of their different subject matters uh, and how they're gonna teach that, there's a five year period to implement these new standards. And you can view them on the OPI website. And I put that link um, into, um, that little document that I put into the chat. Um, our state standards are general principles and they're based on something called the C3 framework that was created by the National Council for Social Studies. And um, I also um, uh, put the link to the C3 framework in the chat uh, so you guys can see that. Um, they include skills um, and they also include very general content. So um, the skills are developing questions, planning inquiries, comparing and evaluating sources, um, using sources to gather evidence and define and develop and refine claims, communicate confusions and take informed action. And I know that taking informed action was actually the reason that um, you invited me to speak. I wrote a, a little um, blog post on that. Um, it's also something interesting that teachers are really anxious about when they look at the new social studies standards. Um, they, they're not sure how to do it. And 
they're um, also anxious that it just means politics and they're anxious about bringing politics into the classroom. But it, taking informed action is sort of the core of what the League has always done. Um, it's something I really admire about the League. Um, so I don't know how much you know of your own history, but um, you know, back in the, in the 60s, the League had study groups on, uh, the cost, on constitutions and what they should be like. And that was really one of the things that led the way to our new state constitution. They studied it, they thought we should have a new one. They you know, pushed for the adopt, and then they started lobbying on it. And, um, and a bunch of league members ultimately were elected to be delegates to the, the CONCON. And the league had a lot to do with, um, after the constitution was written, there was a referendum to adopt it a citizen referendum and, and, lock, and working to get it passed, getting people to vote yes. Um, a lot of league um, members worked on that. So it's a history that you all should be really proud of. Um, there's, I put it again in that document, an article from Montana, the magazine of Western history about that very particular thing in the league's role. But anyway, that taking informed action um, is, uh, is a really interesting new standard that we have. Um, and it can be sharing what you learned with others. It doesn't have to be political. It can be learning about um, the history of the architecture of the community and then taking other people on a walking tour. You know, it can be learning about, um, you know, doing cemetery research and people that are in the cemetery and then, you know, doing cemetery cleanup. It can be learning about the root causes of hunger and, and what the problems are in terms of hunger in your community and then doing a food drive. So it's neither just doing a food drive nor learning about the root causes. It's, it's that informed and action piece together. Um, and so that's something that um, teachers are gonna be asked to help students to, to do soon. Um, so let's see. Um, and when we talk about taking informed action and the league, one place league members might want to consider taking informed action is to learn about and then encourage the teaching of inclusive history um, in schools. And uh, to me, it seems a little hard to believe that that requires informed action. But um, since debates over critical race theory have come to the fore, schools and teachers are feeling tremendous pressure to shy away from anything that could be seen as controversial or upsetting and history by its very nature is controversial and upsetting. You know, our past is complicated and, um, and that's just what it is. And we have to learn about it and we have to understand it. Um, just to give a little background on critical race theory and um, CRT, there's lots of confusion about this, including what it actually is. It's a, a phrase that's become this sort of buzzword catch all that means different things to different people. Um, I can tell you that it is something that is not taught in K-12 schools in Montana. I've now, I don't think anyone has ever been able to point to an example. It's not, the way that critical race theory was traditionally used, it was talking about a theory that was taught in college law, in law school and graduate school. Um, so it's not a thing that's actually being taught in Montana, but it is something that some parents um, who are energized by sort of national conservative conversations, websites, um, media um, are, are, are worried about and are challenging school districts and individual teachers about, um, none of whom are doing anything illegal or even CRT adjacent, but it's, it's, um, um, something that is uh, that school districts could use some support. Um, they're hearing a lot from a, a very small minority of very angry and anxious people. Um, the controversy about critical race theory, I mean, or the, I don't even wanna say it's a controversy, the um, concerns, I'll say that, about critical race theory came up after the standards, our new social studies standards were already approved and published, and it took everyone by surprise. Um, 
where I think that the standards writing committee might have been more explicit in requiring students to learn about slavery, about the civil rights movements and other important topics in United States history because teaching about those sorts of things are, are um, a little bit what's being challenged. Um, I do think it's clear that to meet Montana history standards, teachers in upper grades have to include discussions about racism, discrimination, and colonialism. And just to be really clear, that is not critical race theory, you know, although it's getting tagged or getting, um, people are worried that it might be, but it, it, it's not. Um, and uh, it's simply teaching kind of true inclusive history. Um, so local school districts could use support in that. I have a fact sheet on the topic that I created for educators. And um, again, I put a link to that fact sheet in that little, that document that I linked to at the very beginning um, of different uh, documents. And I'm happy to answer questions about this too. Um, and I don't know if we wanna do, maybe I'll just flip through the presentation and leave room for questions at the end is probably best. Um, so um, one reason that the standards, our new Montana social studies standards don't mention those specific types of topic is that Montana is a local control state and um, school districts set curriculum is what that means. So unlike Massachusetts, so in Massachusetts or in Texas, and I just chose Massachusetts randomly, um, their standards doctor, um, document is 217 pages long and it requires very specific topics to be covered. So it has things like talk about the origins of slavery, it's legal, you know, like, well, you can read. Our standards document is 18 pages long. And so we only do very general, we do not say you need to teach about George Washington. You know, you need to teach about slavery. Um, we say things like identify roles of individuals and groups and their impacts on the United States and tribal historical events. So ours is very general. Um, and that is because we leave the power to set curriculum to individual school districts. There are pros and cons to both approaches. There's something to be said for giving teachers the freedom to teach. And I can sure talk more about that if you want. Um, but it does um, play, it does limit the role that the state plays in developing curriculum. Um, and it's resulted in the Fordham Institute issuing a failing grade for Montana's new state standards. Um, the Fordham Institute uh, looked at all 50 states really recently and it rated them on, the, on, on four criteria, I think. Um, the first is uh, it, to incorporate substantive civics content into every grade in elementary and middle school and ensure that students complete at least one full cycle of US history before high school. Um, and I don't know any school district in Montana where that doesn't have an entire year of US history in high school, but it's not mandated by the state because it's a local control issue. So that's just an example. Um, the Fordham Institute wanted um, the standards to specifically require that high school students take, uh, uh, like I said, a year of US history and a semester of civics. Um, and also um, to specify what would be studied in that, um, in that year. Um, so, um, and, and then they wanted to um, have us hold schools and students accountable for their teaching and learning of civics and US history. So Montana doesn't do any of that. Um, and um, that's something to, to debate, you know, like I said, there's some pros and cons. Um, except the only thing that we do actually require as a state is the teaching of Montana history and culture. And that's, um, that's because um, in 1972, the Constitution um, included Indian, um, Indian history and culture, um, a phrase, they, they said, the state recognizes the distinct and unique cultural heritage of, of the American Indians and is committed in its educational goals to the preservation of their cultural integrity. So 
Um, Indian education is actually written into our constitution and it's the reason that it's the only thing that's actually mandated. Um, in 1999, the legislature passed a law that they called Indian Education for All, uh, or IFA for short, and it requires all Montana schools to teach about Montana Indian history and culture. And then after the law was passed, the state Office of Public Instruction gathered American Indian educators appointed by all the tribal nations to discuss the most important issues regarding the tribes that the tribes thought that all Montanans should understand. And so they came up with this list called the seven essential understanding regarding Montana Indians. And I'm just really curious, um, I don't know if I can see you, but maybe raise your hand. Have you ever heard of, how do I make this so I can see you all? I can't. I don't know, put in the comments. Well, can I even see the comments? Let's just unmute for a minute. Has anyone ever heard of the essential understandings regarding Montana Indians? Oh, there, now I can see you. This has expanded. So, okay, we can raise our hands. Have you ever heard of this? No? One of you? Heard of yeah. It. So um, because of that, and then because it's our constitutional obligation to teach all, um, I think I just got rid of my, you can still see me, right? Mm -hmm. My screen? Yes. Okay. So anyway, I'm just going to share them with you briefly, what the several essential understandings are. And these are things that students are supposed to be learning. The first one is simply focuses on tribal diversity. You know, the Crow are different than the Salish, who are different from the Blackfeet, who are different from the Little Shell. They have different languages, cultures, and histories. That's the first thing that, that the tribes want everyone to know. The second is that not all Indians are the same, even if they're members of the same tribe. So some people are traditionalists, some people are not, people are diverse. Um, so Indians are not all the same, or all Crow people are not all the same. The third is that um, traditional tribal beliefs are still important. Um, some of them, these traditions have been around for thousands of years um, and um, that every tribe has oral histories that are older and are as good as the written histories that are traditionally taught in schools. Um, the fourth is that um, reservations weren't given to the tribes. There's, that's a common misconception. Um, the, the US government acquired um, land that is no longer reserved from the tribes, ostensibly with tribal consent. And so that um, the principle that land should be uh, acquired from tribes only through their consent with treaties involved three assumptions that both parties in the treaty were sovereign powers, um, Indian tribes had some form of transferable land title, and that um, acquisition of Indian land was solely a government matter, not to be left to individual colonists or the states. So that one really deals with the creation of reservations and, um, and treaties. The fifth one is um, that there's uh, been a lot of different federal policies that have affected all the tribes and continue to shape who they are today. And these policies tended to conflict with, you know, conflicted with one another. So, you know, early, so, you know, during the treaty period, tribes were treated as sovereign nation. Then you have the boarding school and allotment period where uh, there was a real attempt to get rid of tribes and assimilate um, individual Indians. And then you have, again, during the 1930s, a respect for tribal authority. Then during the 50s, there's another attempt to get rid of tribes and assimilate individuals. And then in the 1970s, you have, um, again, a respect for um, sovereignty. So that history of the way that um, federal policy has had a lot of impact. The sixth is simply that history is a story most often related through the subjective experience of the teller. So, in other words, um, uh, the history that um, a tribal might member, the way a tribal member might talk about, or let's say a, a, a Sioux person might, a uh, historian might talk about the Battle of the Little Bighorn might be very different than the way a Crow person might talk about that, or the way a, a Euro American person might talk about that. Um, so that perspective piece. And then Finally, that um, American Indian tribal nations are inherent sovereign nations and they possess sovereign powers separate and independent from the federal and state governments. So those are the seven things that um, 
so those are kind of the main things good uh, that have um, our, our, our current state of social studies education. Um, and I whip through them really fast because I'm hoping there'll be questions and I can talk about different things that you're more or less interested in. So that's the formal part of the presentation, but I saved a lot of room for conversation. So we can ask questions now. Yes. I'm wondering. Um, that was great. Great presentation. Yes, thank you. I'm wondering um, how many uh, children in Montana now are homeschooled. And my concern is if there is no uh, requirement that they take history or civics, how many of those homeschool children do not get that kind of training. Sure. So homeschooling is an interesting thing in Montana. Um, ostensibly homeschool students, um, and when I say there's no requirement to take history or civics, I, that's, that's not actually true. So what the requirement is, is, and so if you saw in that very early slide where I said, you know, we have standards, and the standards are um, uh, skills and contents. So in every grade, there's different things about civics and government, economics, geography, and history. So there's four strands of social studies that, that are, are required, but they're not specific things so much like in Massachusetts. So um, for example, like if we're gonna just choose a grade um, in, um, you know, in second grade, you know, um, students need to explain the roles of people who help govern different communities, including tribal communities and demonstrate ways to show good citizenship in the classroom, school and community. So that would be a second grade civic standard. Or um, in, by fifth grade, they need to examine the diverse origins, ideals, and purposes of rules, laws, and key United States constitutional provisions and other foundational documents. Use deliberative process when engaging in civic participation in the classroom or school. Distinguish between the responsibilities of local, state, and tribal and national governments. Explain how, how democracy relies upon active and responsible participation of citizens and describe the basic duties of the three branches of government. So it's not that they're not required civics and there's similar things laid out for history for each grade. It's just not like Massachusetts where they're saying you need to teach about the American Revolution. Like we never say that, you know, you need to teach about Thomas Jefferson. You know, you need to teach about those very specific things. Does that make sense? I have a question. How do they integrate current events? Yeah. Um, so um, it, it, they, I'm just trying to look really fast now through my standards. There doesn't seem to be much of a current event focus um, in elementary. Um, and I think there are, um, I'm looking in civics uh, for high school. Um, um, and they don't, they say there's nothing um, like very specific about current events in the standards. I know that schools again, but the standards aren't curriculum, you know? So I know that schools have students reading about current events um, and talking about them, but it's not written directly into, so far as I can see, into so the, the teacher can standards. incorporate the teacher can incorporate a discussion of current events into whatever their topic Absolutely. they're talking about. 
Right. Okay. So if we're looking at um, the impacts of the of constitutions, laws, treaties, and international agreements on the maintenance of domestic and international relationships, then you might want to look at NATO. You might want to look at um, you know our current um, you know tensions that are growing with um, Russia over Ukraine. Right. You know, okay or evaluate the impact of international agreements on contemporary world issues. So that would be a kind of a, a current event standard. So, yeah, so the teachers are teaching subjects, you know, or topics with the goal, but so this is just the really big, very general umbrella is the state standards. And the school districts will have a lot more to do with the more specific things, you know, so to go to something that I know a lot better in middle school um, history, one of the things that um, uh, one of the one of the middle school history standards is explain how Montana has changed over time and how this history impacts the present. Well, that's all of Montana history, right? You can do anything as a teacher to do that. And so I know Billings School District went and they have a nine week course now in seventh grade that's looking at Montana history and they study the fur trade and they study you know, homesteading and they study all of right. these different events in Montana history. We don't tell them you have to do the fur trade and homesteading. We just tell them, explain how Montana has changed over time. So, if that, so that's the role of the state versus the role of the district. Um, and then teachers have some flexibility in their classroom, even underneath what the district says, right? Um, and the other thing for Montana history, I can tell you is that we've put out just a ton of curriculum resources and lesson plans to help teach specifically Montana history. So we have a, we're publishing right now a textbook for fourth grade because fourth grade also has that standard of explaining how Montana has changed over time and how this history impacts the present. And we have a textbook that we published for seventh grade. So, we, so we're providing material that they can use, but we're not mandating it. And OPI isn't mandating. To, to answer your homeschool question, um, I don't know that much about homeschool except to say that my sense is Montana homeschool laws are very, very, uh, loose. So like some states, when you homeschool, you have to um, give detailed lesson plans, you have to have your students test and certain things, you know, and in Montana, you pretty much just have to say, this is my understanding, um, we're homeschooling. Yeah, uh, you register with the state. You reg no, you register with your county superintendent. Uh, or the county superintendent, county. excuse me, yes. Yeah, yeah counter superintendent of schools. And you register, but you're not required to um, no. give detailed lesson plans no. or anything like that. No. You just register. So. A question. Yeah. It's not really a question. It seems like um, just one of, the one of the comments you made in your workshop is teachers being really frightened by the CRT stuff, frightened. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's really, really tricky to be a social <laughs> studies teacher right now. Um, I think, yeah. That, that, yeah, could you talk about that? Do teachers talk about that? A little bit. So, you know, I think, I think a couple of things. I mean, I've had some teachers tell me I was really nervous, but it's just been fine. No one, you know, again, I think it's a very loud 5% or 3%, you mm. know? Um, uh, so I've had teachers say, yeah, I was anxious and nothing's come of it. I know um, Dylan Huiskin, who was the 2019 Montana Teacher of the Year, teaches social studies, middle school social studies in Bonner. And he had a parent come up to him at the beginning of the year and ask him, are you teaching CRT? And Dylan just diffused it by saying, you know, I don't really know what you mean by that. So if you can define it for me, then I can tell you whether I'm teaching it. And the parent was just kind of like, oh, you know, it's a buzzword. And so that yeah. used that um, really successfully. I know of another teacher in uh, Bozeman actually, 
uh, social study, a high school history teacher who on her syllabus said something like students would be um, reading diverse uh, primary sources and a parent asking her for the list of all the like, and primary sources are just like letters and diary entries and, you know, different documents, firsthand accounts. And so, you know, speeches, newspaper. Um, and so a parent did ask her, you know, I don't, I want to know exactly what my student is reading. Um, so, yeah, I think it is. Um, I think it depends on who you are, where you're at. Um, when I met with teacher, and I think they're nervous about it. And what I'm nervous about, and I have so much respect for social studies teachers, and they're the ones that have to field questions from parents and from their principals. And what I can tell you is there is no, the only thing, so Elsie Arntzen requested um, an opinion from attorney, Elsie Arntzen is the superintendent of public instruction. And she requested that attorney general Austin Knutson give a formal opinion about critical race theory. And so he did. And I, the, my frequently asked questions for teachers has a link to his opinion. And the first 20 pages is basically saying CRT is bad and talking to some things, examples from other states, you know, where in California, there was a teacher that did X you know, separated students by race to discuss a document or, um, you know, whatever, and kind of pulling out examples that he thought were not good. Um, and some of them weren't good, you know, but they also seem very, you, 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 when you read the literature um, from places like the Heritage Foundation and other right-wing think tanks that are really pushing this issue, they're using the same five examples over and over again, right? So everyone makes mistakes. I am sure there was a teacher in California that did something that was really inappropriate with her students. Like I have no doubt that that happened because it happens, you know? But um, anyway, but they, they keep on repeating those same sort of five examples um, as opposed to like, there's no sense that it's actually a pervasive problem. And then, um, so after this kind of talking about it, then the last like four pages are like looking at the law. And basically what he says in looking at the law is you can't discriminate on the basis of race um, under the 1964 um, Civil Rights Act and um, under the Montana Constitution. Um, so that's what's illegal. So like that, it was nothing new. Right, that's illegal. Teachers should not discriminate on the basis of race. And they shouldn't. So, but that's not how it's being read and thought about, you know. Um, and so, so people are a little nervous. Um, and uh, yeah, so my, so what my big fear is, I guess is what I, is the way this started was that school districts and teachers are gonna be like self-censoring. So it's doing, like they're not doing anything. They have not been doing anything wrong, you know? And in fact, they've been doing things that are, are right um, in terms of teaching about the civil rights movement, for example, right? It's part of American history. It's part of all American history textbooks. It is absolutely, if you're teaching a US history class, it would be, ridiculous to skip the civil rights movement. It's just impossible to teach American history without talking about, you know, that. And uh, I just worry, and I'm sure they'll touch on the civil rights movement. I th I, I'm not worried that they're gonna give it up altogether, but I'm just worried about self-censoring and the, the fear, do you know what, I, kind of um, um, making them uh, be less able to do their jobs, if that makes sense. As I thought, I didn't mean to, social studies does sound really hard. I was thinking also of a friend who taught in a very small rural, rural school and was not allowed to teach evolution for science. Right, so yeah, that's, up in yeah. Other subjects too. Sure, and my gosh, health teachers have it really hard too. Ooh, yeah. So one thing I did find out, and I only found this out yesterday by accident, and I meant to look into it more. Apparently last legislative session, a law was passed 
that said that teachers or you know schools have to give parents 48 hours notice for whatever topic is being taught now. So that um, there's a, now an, a, like a, a, a notice requirement so that in a school district, so basically you have to post your syllabus, um, but that way if a parent is worried about evolution or worried about, you know, sex ed or worried about a social studies topic, they know 48 hours in advance and I guess they can pull their student or somehow address it or, or talk to the teacher about it. So that's new, just this last session. So that adds an addition, I mean, that, you know, that adds an additional burden to teachers and, and schools, an additional sense of being watched, um, which is never fun, you know, it's not, it's not comfortable, I think, for them. I have a question. Um, I, I don't remember the exact name of this outfit, but uh, this Texas organization that sort of um, commands what books are published. Um, how much is, are the textbooks of Montana impacted by some of these uh, books that tend to leave out all sorts of things that they don't want to acknowledge. Right. So, um, and so this is, you know, when I said there's pros and cons on the whole local control thing. In states like Texas and California and Massachusetts, there's not local control. There's state, it's centralized state control. And then Texas, I don't remember them either, but it's like their board of education. Um, sets very close standards and also also says what textbooks can be used in Texas schools. So they choose the textbook for Texas schools, um, all of them. And that board was taken over by um, some very conservative people um, who were pretty committed to underplaying uh, and historical revisionists who wanted certain things taught, you know, underplaying the damages of slavery, um, Kind of hagiography in terms of our founding fathers instead of looking at people warts and all so they had a, a political agenda and because it's such a big state and because they buy so many books textbook companies were listening to them right and were saying oh okay yeah we'll have to make edits so that the texas board will adopt our book California is also a very big state. They have, you know, they also have a lot of influence. They have a different perspective than Texas. Um, you don't, you know, so, um, and I, I don't know you, what you hear about when you read just casually is the Texas stuff. Um, I haven't actually looked into it to know um, if California, you know, if there are other textbooks that are trying to, to buy to be adopted in California schools, I, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so school districts, again, every school district decides what textbook they're gonna adopt. So there's no standard textbooks. There's, OPI doesn't recommend textbooks. Um, I mean, they don't even, I mean, quite literally, they don't even recommend. It's not, it's not that they don't require, they won't recommend because they're that scared of overstepping in terms of local control. So I don't think anyone knows what books are used in, in across Montana schools because it's, it's district by district. Or how old they are. Or how old they are, how often they're replaced, yeah. Oh. Back to the law that uh, requires a notice to be posted. Yeah. How, are they just to post about controversial subjects or everything? My understanding is everything. And like I said, I only heard about this by accident yesterday because I was talking to this uh, curriculum coordinator of Helena Public Schools about something different. And she mentioned that this law had been passed. So I think it's less burdensome than it, you know, now that we have the internet and teachers have websites and you can post your weekly schedule on your website, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna be covering you know, um, the gold rush this week in class, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. 
but again, it, it does add this layer of feeling like you're watched, I think, mm -hmm. and, that, and uh, worrying about that. So I guess I'd just say, be kind to your social studies teachers, like, so, and, and they're getting so attacked, you know, and, and the curriculum, the curriculum coordinators are getting attacked and there's a lot of angry people calling up saying, what are you doing? And so just um, some kind voices of reason would not be amiss, you know. Um. That's across Montana. It doesn't matter if it's a big district or a small district. Or a small that's town. my, well, I mean, that's my understanding. You know, I don't really know. I know the big districts um, are, um, you know, and I didn't, I did not go to our school board meeting. And, and I, again, this is partly coming from the um, curriculum coordinator at Helena Public Schools, but she said that last week's school board meeting was just vicious and she said for the first time in her life she attended by zoom because of covid concerns but she said if she had been at physically at the meeting because the meeting wasn't physically uh it was in a place she said she would have been scared to walk to her car mm -hmm. um she said it's the first time she's and it wasn't just curriculum though it's it's mask mandates or not mask mandates it's you know a whole host of issues it's not all content related Mm -hmm. um but it's COVID protocols um and that kind of thing and and it's just the um, the volume and the heat I, you know it's kind of like I don't you know those town halls back when the tea party just had become a thing and people were yelling at each other you know it, it sounds like school boards are the new school board meetings are the new um like place where people can um express themselves, not in a civil, not way, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what you want to see. Like I was raised and I'm sure y'all are because you're legal women voters, that you can disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. And um, for just a, a huge respect for civil discourse and learning each other's points of view. And that does not seem to be the way. And again, I think it's, again, a very small vocal minority. So it, it might be interesting for y'all to just tune in to the next Billings uh, school board meeting and see what the tone is in Billings. Um, and, um, I, you know, I don't know, but she said here it was bad. And she said she's heard bad things in Missoula has been very, and I know a fabulous, fabulous superintendent, um, school superintendent of Eureka retired. Um, everyone adored, like his teachers adored him. He had a tremendous reputation across the state as just being a very good uh, educational leader. And he said, I'm done. And he quit mid-year and he said, I'm retiring to a cabin in the woods. And that's a heartbreaking loss for, uh, you know, Eureka Public Schools. Um, that's up in the northwest corner of the state over by Libby. So. You know, here in uh, in Billings, in our league, we have people who um, attend county and city uh, council meetings from league as observers. And we have an Energy and Conservation Commission. I attend those meetings from the league as a representative. This makes me think that we should consider having volunteers from league attend our school board meetings with prepared ideas of how to respond if um, this kind of disruption and disrespect occurs at our meetings, that we are ready to respond to them. Um, so that's- hey, Yeah. Jeff. I mean, that might be worth thinking about. And, and a response could just be, you know, I'm so sorry you're being yelled at and disrespected. And as the League of Women Voters, we believe in civil discourse and, and we support, you know, um, uh, you know, talking about things that are hard um, in a way that people feel heard and we appreciate your efforts. 
interest in making that happen. Something just really simple um, in the public comment section. And I don't know if it's going on in Billings, but it might be worth uh, looking into. You um, never know when it's going to erupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Seems that that might be a useful, that would be a useful thing for us to do. That's a good idea. Another sort of a idea that I wanted to ask about and mention, and that is, <laughs> I listened to on public radio, The Hidden Brain with Chakra Vedantin. You all might pick it up every now and then on a, a Sunday, but um, it, I hear him talking about how the mind works and wishing that our civics classes could be, uh, or teachers could be addressing this issue uh, explaining to kids how their mind works, such as we've all heard this thing about if you repeat a lie or an inaccuracy enough times, the brain starts to believe it. Um, the, re the role of emotion in implanting ideas in people, uh, what gets the attention in the newspaper is the... Um, thing you have an emotional response to and then how the mind wants to fit things together so the mind is interested and will buy into conspiracy theories uh, that sort of thing i don't know if there's any um movement or going on in civics education to incorporate how the brain works yeah, that's really interesting. And it definitely would fit under the social studies standards. We have a standards that's analyze the impact and roles of personal interests and perspectives, market media and group influences on the application of civic virtues, democratic principles, constitutional rights and human rights in the 912 grades, whether they're actually teaching it in the way that you're talking about. And again, that's the kind of thing that you can talk to the school district about, you can talk to the board, you can talk to the curriculum coordinator, um, because that's a, having specific, something specific like that as a local control, you know, they're the ones that set the curriculum, if that makes sense, so. But part of what you said was that they do evaluate um, their resources. And so the, 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 reading the media, including TV or um, other other sources of information, should should kind of uh, meet what Carol is talking about. The school and the school district and the teachers evaluate the resources. Is that what you're saying? Oh, not the kids. The kids. Well, the kids. The, the kids are required to absolutely. Yes, the kids are required to learn how to um, compare and evaluate sources for relevance, perspective, and accuracy. So that's a skill that's required in the new social studies standards. Um, absolutely, you know. Um, and yeah. I think that oh, there's tons of uh, pushback from parents when they find out that their kids are analyzing Fox News. So is there pushback or? or? I, I, I'm just betting that there is. Because Fox News uh, provides all kinds of false information in their news and they, they work so hard to churn up issues that uh, are going to keep people uh, insisting that uh, uh, masks don't accomplish anything with COVID or whatever. So there's a really good, um, and this is, you know, if you want to, to um, encourage your school district to help students I did not put this on my in my little sheet to help students analyze um, news, analyze different types of sources. There's Stanford History Education Group put together some, a program called Civic Online Reasoning, 
And um, what they found in doing studies is that, and it started with something as basic as um, students thinking that the Holocaust uh, didn't, didn't happen because they read about it on a website. And the school district was really upset and they were like, oh no, we need to do more Holocaust education. And this professor at Stanford said, no, I don't think that's what you really need to do. What you really need to do is teach students how to tell the difference between what's false and what's true on the, you're inundated by so much information all the time now. And so they created this program called Civic Online Reasoning that teaches very explicitly how to, I um, mean, help students learn how to look at a website or look at a, you know, a Facebook, any, a post, you know, and how do you figure out is that true or not? And it's a really interesting, um, it's, worth, it's worth everyone looking at actually. Um, and it goes against a little bit something that teachers, so teachers, at least when my kids were young, were teaching, oh, you can't trust Wikipedia because it's crowdsourced. But they actually talk to fact checkers and they're like, how do you tell? And they're like, well, we go to w Wikipedia, not to check the information, but to find out if it's the Heritage Foundation, he's putting out a report. We go and look up the Heritage Foundation on Wikipedia and we find out what their bias is. Oh, they're a conservative think tank or, oh, they're a liberal think tank, you know, and so and they give examples, you know, so there's like um, that kind of help. And they talk about this thing called lateral reading where you don't just read straight through a web page. You have that page open and you have other pages open, fact checking, but also checking perspective and checking biases. And it's a whole new skill um, and it's a really good program. Um, so that's something that you could encourage the billing school district to adopt as well. Oh, thanks. I have to go. That again. It's civic online reasoning, and I put a link to it in the chat. Oh, okay. I, I need to go. I have another Zoom meeting at one o'clock. <laughs> but I, before I go, because I you all can decide what to do. But I, I just wanted to really thank you. That was wonderful, Martha. I learned so much. That was oh. wonderful. Well, I'm happy to be with you and I really admire the work you're doing. So, um, thanks. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thanks, Anne. That was wonderful. All right. That was absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. Are we, if, I guess. Jean, Jean, did you have a question? Oh, it wasn't really a question, just a comment that what we've been talking about here, I think, is under that heading of teaching critical thinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Martha. That was great. Thanks for having me. Thank okay. you. Bye. Thank you. And I'm going to stop recording if that's okay. All right.